coming. I'm uh, happy to share some of my uh, new work. So I just to tell you in terms of my background, I'm an anthropologist by training. And um, I lived in Cairo for six years and my PhD was about the concept of secularism in, in the connection of the Egyptian women's movement. And that was in the mid 90s. Um, but uh, really since the late 90s, I've been working on Iraq. I'm half Iraqi. The other half, as you can tell from my accent, is German. <laughs> um, and uh, so for really my main work over the last decade or so has been trying to document the impact of the Ba'ath regime, sanctions, invasion, and occupation on women and gender relations in Iraq. Uh, and that's really where I've put all my, this, my academic and activist efforts. But a couple of years ago, I think I, at that time, I'd written an article about the impact of ISIS on gender-based violence in Iraq, and I just felt, for my own sanity, I need to take a break from Iraq. And also, I felt it was increasingly difficult to do research in Iraq. So I thought, okay, you know, where would I like to go? I mean, I like Beirut, but I thought, okay, why don't I um, go to uh, Turkey? And the reason why I chose Turkey, and not just Turkey, but the Turkish-Kurdish conflict, because I was really uh, very much intrigued about uh, you know, these images that started to appear in the newspapers. Um, yeah, I'm sure you've all seen them, these sort of Amazonian fighters, the um, Kurds in Rojava fighting ISIS. And uh, you know, I was very much intrigued with the way that um, you know, these images uh, and you know, it's often quite sort of sexualized and you know, exotic and Amazonian woman contrasted uh, the depiction of the PKK as a terrorist organization. Um, and I knew, I mean, I didn't know that much about the Kurdish political struggle and what was going on in Rojava, but I knew that there was a connection, ideological and political connection between PKK ideology and what's happening there. And I was quite struck by the disconnect between the two. So I was curious. The other thing that made me curious um, is the fact that, I mean, as a feminist uh, scholar, I've learned a lot about um, sort of historical, different historical and cross-cultural contexts in which revolution, revolutions that are linked with armed struggle might at certain points open up spaces for women especially you know, when women also carry arms. We've seen it in Palestine, we've seen it in Algeria, but we've also seen it in Vietnam, we've seen it in uh, Eritrea. But the moment when the armed struggle stops, uh, what we have seen happening historically and cross-culturally actually is that spaces are shrinking. And often there is even a backlash against uh, sort of gender-based um, equality and justice and sort of the idea of you know, women should go back to some constructed form of traditional gender roles. So I wanted to understand, is there something different going on in the Kurdish armed struggle? Because, I mean, there's lots of claims. You must have heard the claims about, you know, women's rights and the centrality of gender-based um, justice for the Kurdish struggle. So I wanted to, to study that. And as someone who had spent quite a bit of time, well, not by choice, but because of the conditions in Iraq, looking at war and conflict, I was particularly interested in the way that um, conflict in, the, in, in Turkey, more specifically the Turkish-Kurdish conflict, how it plays out in terms of gender norms and relations. And, um, you know, more specifically what I wanted to study was the relationship between feminist activists and peace activists. Um, one reason I was interested in that is that in 2014, I was invited to attend um, several events around International Women's Day in Istanbul. And then afterwards, there was a big march. And this was after the Gezi protests. And there you know, was lots of police on the streets. And there was tear gas. And I was so moved by the thousands of um, young women and some men and transgender people who were on the street and shouting Kurdish slogans. And that was totally in contrast to what I knew about the Turkish 
women's movement, which historically was very much linked to uh, Kemalism, Turkish Republic, very nationalist, and I knew that historically there was a big gap between the Turkish feminist movement that was very nationalist and then the Kurdish women's movement. And then to see these young Turkish women, some of them also Kurdish, you know, shouting Kurdish slogans, I thought, wow, this is the shit. Okay, so this is this is all the background. What interested me in the topic, and uh, but unfortunately I don't speak Turkish nor do I speak Kurdish, and I felt that um, it was too much to take on by myself. So I uh, linked up with a Turkish Kurdish scholar who's been working on Kurdish political movement for a while. So it's a joint project. Um, I should say though, and here I'm going to sort of move back uh, a bit that. Um, and I want to take a moment also to express my solidarity with my colleagues. Although I had originally, um, one reason was to find some respite from the conflict in Iraq and go to a place that's more peaceful, but um, as things have developed in Turkey, I actually do not know whether I can continue uh, my research. I mean, my PhD student a few months ago I was detained at the airport and uh, she was told that she was a threat to national security and she cannot enter Turkey for the next five years. So I've written a few things in solidarity with my colleagues. You must have heard the Academics for Peace Movement who have signed a petition in January and over a thousand of them have been threatened. Many of them have lost their jobs already. And of course now after the uh, coup, the failed coup in July, there has been a purging of uh, everyone. I mean, academics, deans, intellectuals, journalists. So it's a very, very difficult time. And I, I, you know, I don't know if what would happen if I would go now, as I wrote a few things that were published in Turkish. So I don't think I can continue this project short term, I hope, in the future. So just to say, you know, take a moment and really um, pay tribute to, to my colleagues. And uh, the reason they signed this petition, I don't know if you know, but they signed the petition in January was precisely to criticize the Turkish government for the very violent crackdown on Kurdish communities in southeastern Turkey. So it was, you know, Turkish intellectuals taking a position against uh, the Turkish state's policies on, on Kurds. Um, so the, the, the research, uh, the empirical research for the project uh, so far has taken place in four different cities. So this is Diyarbakir, which is um, a large uh, majority Kurdish town in southeastern Turkey. And because it is there are about two million people who live in Diyarbakir, in uh, Kurdish called Ahmed. Um, and because it is the larger, largest Kurdish city in Turkey, it's kind of uh, perceived to be like the unofficial capital of uh, Kurdish, Kurdistan, uh, certainly in the, in the northern part of Kurdistan. And it's quite a beautiful city, uh, although I should say that when I arrived, uh, it's about a year ago that I arrived there, um, the evening arrived, there was a very big explosion, and since then, certainly the old part of the town that you see here, Sur, has been destroyed by the Turkish police. The other uh, city, um, which I've been doing, um, Fieldwork is very nice to choose that as a site of Fieldwork is uh, Istanbul. Um, and largely because um, the research involves Turkish feminists, but also many, of course, Kurdish activists, feminist activists, and peace activists are also based in Istanbul. And then, um, given that um, there is a very large Turkish and Kurdish com uh, diaspora, in Europe, uh, I decided to also uh, interview people in Berlin. This is Kreuzberg, I don't know if any of you visited um, Berlin, but that's an area that's very known for the large Turkish and Kurdish population. And there's quite a bit of political mobilization going on, of course, Turks and Kurds. Uh, although the, mm, it's interesting that the Kurdish and Turkish population in Berlin tends to be more conservative politically than the Turkish Kurdish population in London. And the reason being that there are very different migration trajectories. So 
many of the Turks and Kurds who came to Germany came as part of labor migration, uh, as opposed to the Turks and Kurds who came to London who often came as part of political persecution. So many of them are in a part of leftist organizations that were forced to flee <coughs> after the military coup in the 80s. Uh, so that's one of my favorite restaurants in, in uh, London. It's very good. Uh, in Stoke Newington. And there's a very large uh, uh, Turkish and Kurdish community that's very politically uh, active and many Kurdish feminists are, I mean, they're organizing events these days almost every week. Okay, so, I mean, I don't really have time and probably I'm also not really interested in getting a very detailed account of the Turkish uh, Kurdish conflict. But I feel I should tell you a little bit. Um, so, so far, I mean, the Turkish Kurdish conflict has claimed, uh, you know, about 100,000 uh, lives, although, you know, there are no official statistics, or official stati statistics vary greatly. And, um, you know, historically, it's really was the beginning of um, the Turkish Republic in 1923 that Kurds, as also, of course, other ethnic uh, minorities uh, in, in Turkey, have been uh, persecuted. Um, and many Kurds were forced to assimilate uh, and forced to discard their Kurdishness. Uh, but uh, Kurdish national sentiments uh, kind of endured and were strengthened by the, by the oppression uh, and also forced migration. Um, and, you know, just to give you an idea, I mean, what am I talking about? I mean, the extent that, for instance, uh, Kurdish communities were not allowed to speak their own language or to, you know, follow certain cultural practices. I mean, so quite radical. Uh, now, the, uh, the Kurdish Workers' Party, the PKK, uh, was founded in uh, in the 80s, and uh, ever since it launched its first attack on a military uh, base in Turkey, uh, which was in 1984, there has been a persistent state of conflict with varying levels of intensity. And prior to this recent uh, flare of conflict since last year, people always told me about the 90s. So 1990s was when there was this big open conflict between the state um, and uh, the Kurdish political movement. And what I mean here, you know, like 3,000 villages that were destroyed, thousands of people who had to flee. There was this large wave of migration from Turkey to Europe. Um, you know, lots of people were killed, lots of people were arrested. There were, uh, you know, lots of torture. So this is kind of, you know, always people told me, oh, the 90s were so bad. But now, and that's very sad for me to hear, people actually tell me it's worse now than it was in the 90s. So the level of destruction, the level of persecution, um, the level of authoritarianism of the state. Um, so I assume you know who that is? Yes, Abdullah Achala. So uh, Abdullah Öcalan, who's the founder of the, the PKK, um, he was arrested in 1999. And, uh, you know, this is, I'm, 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 as I said, I can't go into any details, but I think what's important to mention is that after his uh, arrest, and then he was supposed to be uh, killed, and uh, there were negotiations, uh, he uh, basically announced that violence was meaningless and that the PKK was going to change its strategy so that it would shift from a violent militant political movement to one that would pr uh, pursue political means. And um, this was also the time, very importantly, to put this in context, when the Turkish gov government was very eager to seek uh, membership of the EU, when it was still cool to be part of the EU. <laughs> speak as someone who is, you know, I'm devastated about British vote referendum, we should never put things to referendum, it's very bad. <laughs> um, now, the, uh, this period also coincided with the rise uh, of the power of the reformist 
well, that's how they package themselves anyway, the reformist, Islamist, AKP, um, which uh, very much challenged the previously all-powerful secular military elite of Turkey. Um, now, we have now, of course, uh, you recognize it too. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we have the, the new um, Sultan, thank you, who is very much playing on Ottomania. And you know that uh, those of you who watch uh, Turkish soap operas, you know that uh, Ottoman based soap operas are very popular, not just in Turkey, but elsewhere in the region. So this whole theme of you know creating this new grand uh, you know it's not just being president you know, for life but uh, you know this this empire um, and uh, I uh, yeah the level of authoritarianism is really quite shocking. Now the other the other element that I'd like to mention is that so for the long time for a long time the PKK monopolized. Um, Kurdish politics in Turkey. But over the last year, there has been, since the late 90s, there's always been a political party that changed their names all the time, uh, partly because they were closed down by the Turkish state. But I don't know if any, any of you followed the elections last year, I mean, the first ones, and any of you know something about the, the HDP. But certainly for myself, who doesn't like politicians, full stop, I think it was one of the few occasions over the last um, decades that I actually felt inspired by the HDP, which is uh, not a Kurdish political party, it's a Kurdish-led progressive alliance. And all my feminist and LGBTQ activist friends actually in Turkey were supporting the party. And um, one of the things that's striking about the party, as you see here too, the two um, co-chairs, um, uh, Fige and Yurt Zedak, uh, the woman, and then uh, Demetaj Salatin, uh, Salatin Demetaj, sorry. Um, they uh, practice this idea of co-chairing. Okay? The idea that any political uh, leadership position should be shared um, between a man and a woman. So I have to say, initially when I heard this, I was incredibly skeptical, because everything I knew about quotas either from the Egyptian context or very much from the Iraqi context, uh, didn't make me think that there was necessary relationship between having a woman in the job and having greater gender-based rights. I mean, in the Iraqi context, where you have a 25% quota enshrined in the constitution, what it often means is having the wives, daughters, and sisters of uh, male conservative politicians. Having said that, uh, still I think you know you would have the male conservative politicians on their own. So you might as well have some female conservative. <laughs> and um, also, while the women, I think initially in parliament, certainly the first rounds, I think were very much looking to their male counterparts before voting. I think this time that changed. But anyway, I'm not. I, I can't say that I'm against quotas. I think that you know. We need them, but I certainly don't think that they, you know, that I don't believe in the add women and stir principle. You know, we, we need to transform rather than just add, mm -hmm. you know, some token women. So I was skeptical, uh, but I have to say that in the course of my research, I uh, became much more uh, positive about this, this model. Um, now, I think the other thing in terms of context uh, that is really important to stress is that the, the Kurdish political movement in terms of ideology shifted, at least officially, because I think in practice it's much more complex, but officially it shifted its aim from uh, nationalist, national independence, in other words, independent Kurdistan, right? and uh, the PKK is, of course, also very much informed, was very much informed by Marxist Leninist principles, to this idea of radical uh, democratic confederalism as expressed in Abdullah Öcalan's more recent prison writings, and sort of the idea that you know you can have radical democracy within existing nation states. Uh, you don't have to have an independent nation state. 
even further to actually say that nation states are the problem uh, and that um, you know, federalism is a much more democratic solution. And crucially, um, we know that historically, post-culturally, all these revolutionary movements would always tell us, us meaning us women, well, we will first address the big issue and then we'll deal with your problems. I mean, that's been historically always the case. And here, actually, you have a political leader, the uber patriarch, I should say, though, who tells us, you know, gender-based equality is not a side issue, but is central, is at the center of radical democracy. I mean, that is radical. And that's, I would say, is unique, and that's, I would say, the, the, the Kurdish political movement, certainly in the context of Turkey and Syria, is different from other radical political movements. Um, okay, so this is all background. Uh, one other thing is that although the PKK, um, you know, at some point said, you know, we are, uh, we offer a ceasefire, um, we don't believe in violence anymore, of course, over the years, there have still have been violent clashes. Uh, and there's also been the formation of a youth militant group. And um, the people I talked to uh, were divided over the relationship between the PKK and the youth militia. Some say that the youth militia is just the youth wing of the PKK. And some told me, no, it's more independent. Some said, well, the PKK doesn't really have any control over it anymore, even though they initially started it. So that's just to sort of, it's important because the recent year when you had clashes in cities in southeastern Turkey where uh, people actually built trenches and were fighting against the police, it was people from this use more so than the okay. So against this background, uh, one of the things that I uh, wanted to know is, you know, how do people actually um, conceptualize peace? You know, what do they mean when they say peace? I mean, those uh, women, and also we spoke actually to men who were involved in peace activism and gender-based activism. And there's one uh, organization that uh, I spoke to many members. It's called the, the Women for Peace Initiative. Uh, and both Turkish and Kurdish um, people are involved in this. This initiative was founded in 2009. And uh, it was uh, after, this is after mm, a large number of Kurdish women uh, struggling for peace and women's freedom were arrested in 2009. And then subsequently they started this organization. <coughs> and so between 2009 and 2012 they organized lots of demonstrations and events, sit-ins, um, trying to raise consciousness about the impact of war and conflict in both communities and also to try to understand each other. I think this was very important in actually shifting consciousness amongst Turkish feminists who until then had been really more nationalist. Uh, and had, when they were spoke, speaking about the Kurdish women, you know, those poor Kurdish women who were oppressed by the Kurdish men, but who wouldn't consider for the role of the Turkish state uh, in, in, uh, in equalities. So, um, the first person I'm going to, um, I'm just going to share a few quotes here. One was Hilal, I'm not going to mention the full name to protect her. She was both an activist and academic, and she told me, uh, when I first spoke to her last September, my father was a soldier. He went to Kurdistan in 1991. He was a teacher, and he was sent there. He is a Turkish nationalist man. But he said that if he was a Kurd, he would kill all of us, meaning all of us Turks. He hated the military, but he is very nationalist. And she continued, the word peace is somehow becoming an empty signifier. You organize a peace rally and then people use a post of Öcalan. This is a combatant position. You use the military leader. Are you for armed struggle or are you for peace? However, and this is very interesting, when I spoke to her again in uh, February of this year, so there's six months in between, this is after she had signed the petition against the government and after she was actually, a day afterwards, she was made redundant. She was one of the few people who immediately lost her job. And when I spoke with her again about this, she said, I don't care. 
I don't mind having the picture of Achena there. The important thing is to fight the government. And she um, switched her view, and many, uh, many of the Turkish women actually uh, sort of similarly had, had sh shifted their, their view. Um, now, the other, uh, another academic activist uh, told me, peace is embraced by everyone, but everyone has a different depiction of peace. Almost 90% of Kurdish women see the freedom of Öcalan as a general condition for peace, and secondly, a general amnesty for PKK fighters is also seen as a condition. She added, the younger generation of Kurds do have a problem with Turks as well, not just the state. And she actually did some research on sort of uh, uh, Kurdish youth, and she found that there was a gap between the older generation of Kurds, Kurdish political activists who said, our problem is with the state, and then the younger generation said it's not just the state, it's also ordinary people. And I have to say, in comparison to what I've experienced living in Egypt, what I've experienced in, in Iraq, I've never actually come across so much nationalism as in Turkey. Um, and it was quite shocking. And particularly what I found shocking that even amongst the left, so-called progressive, nationalism is just I mean, it's so big. I mean, that was for me, uh, you know, quite, uh, well, strange. Um, so, but what I, what I mean with that, that is that um, Turkish intellectuals, I mean, not even to speak about the general population that has been lynching Kurds. I mean, if you go to Western uh, Turkey, you know, while the state was cracking down on Kurdish towns in southeastern Turkey, it was the normal Turkish population, not all of those, but there was normal people who were lynching people because they were Kurds. And so it's not just the state. Um, one of the founders of the Women for Peace initiative said, peace can and should be between two or more sides. But peace in Turkey is very one-sided. The Kurdish side is asking to have peace, but our Turkish side is silent. And after a while, the word peace itself is losing its meaning. It becomes an empty word. As an anthropologist and peace activist, I know the meaning and difficulty. And since 2001, I've witnessed the Kurdish women, the, the Kurdish women's movement for peace in Kurdish cities like Mardin, Diyarbakir, and Urfa. Those of us living in Istanbul had to learn a lot from women living in the east of the country. Peace means listening to, to another person. And I, I felt I was very moved by that. I think that's, that's really sort of important insight that, you know, we have, of course, feminist conceptualizations of peace have moved away from sort of simple ideas of peace meaning cessation of armed conflict. I mean, we know that peace does not uh, requires more than simply the cessation of armed conflict. We know that violence, there's a continuum of violence between the battlefield and what's happening in the street and the workplace at home. But also, you know, peace, then, when we sort of change and move away from what violence and conflict means to what does peace, what would peace entail, um, you know, I liked that, you know, one of the things that she stressed was you just sort of to listen, and, you know, the way we listen. And I think that, um, for me, that was a kind of important insight as well. And I should say that many of the Turkish feminists I talked to told me and stressed that they learned a lot from their Kurdish counterparts. Um, now I'm going to uh, quote one more Turkish person because I'm, before I'm moving on to some Kurdish activists. And this uh, I'd like to share, um, and she was happy to have her name uh, quoted, um, Ipek Buskurt. She's a Turkish lawyer. And she has, had, has been at the forefront in Turkey uh, around cases related to gender-based violence and divorce. So women who want to divorce their husbands and then have been victims of uh, gender-based violence and even attempted murder. And she's been you know, very courageously involved in that. And she told me that um, during the conflict between Turks and Kurds, many Kurdish women have learned about politics and have become aware of many issues in society including violence against women. They are great activists now. They are not just fighting for their societal and ethnic rights, but also for gender-based rights. 
course, Kurdish society continues to be very patriarchal, mas a very patriarchal masculine society, as many other Middle Eastern societies. In that environment, Kurdish women are bravely challenging men's mentality and changing their society and their life. When their son or daughter go to the mountain to fight against the Turkish state, the Kurdish mothers are aware that their son or daughter might be killed, but for a purpose, for their rights. But from the Turkish side, things are different. Women are not very well organized. They still follow state propaganda. For example, when a Turkish mother sends her son to military, she does not think that he might be killed. But when it happens, this can be a very big shock for her. Most of the time, she does not even know for what reason she lost her son. But the state tells her that she should be proud of her son because her son died for the state, and she starts saying, long live the state, without knowing what it means. Now, um, I, uh, many, of the, many of the Kurdish uh, activists that I spoke to, um, you know, their views very much resonated uh, with, uh, with what uh, this uh, Turkish lawyer said. Um, and then I, you know, I was interested to find out, you know, this whole shift from Kurdish nationalism to this idea of confederalism or radical democracy in, in, in the confederal state. Um, I found that uh, all the Kurdish women's rights activists I spoke to, you know, were saying the same thing. But I, I felt, okay, I wonder, you know, what, well, first of all, I wonder, of course, um, people telling me this, I mean, this can be kind of the official story. But I also wonder, you know, what is the relationship between the Kurdish political elite, because there is a political elite, and, you know, ordinary people. And although I haven't really had a chance to do much research into that, but I know that, in reality, people's views are much more diverse. So there are lots of, uh, especially now after the brutal crackdown by the state, there are lots of Kurds who say we want an independent state. There is no way that we can have radical democracy within the existing uh, nation state. Um, but um, how much time do I have left, by the way? 20 minutes? 20 minutes. Yeah. So. Um, now I wanted to share a little bit how Kurdish women um, conceptualize conflict because, you know, before speaking about peace, they wanted to speak with me about conflict. Uh, and uh, this is actually a quote that um, my colleague, uh, he managed to speak to Sakina Chanzis. She uh, was assassinated in Paris. She was one of the founding members of the PKK. She was a very uh, well-known uh, woman activist. And she was involved in 2012. There was a 68-year-long, uh, uh, not year long, 68-day-long hunger strike. And uh, shortly after that, uh, she was um, she was assassinated in Berlin. Uh, and a couple of weeks before her assassination, my colleague, colleague managed to speak to her, and she said, "Our Kurdish identity and language already exist, whether the Turkish state accepts it or not." But our fight is not just against the power of the state. It is also against societal codes, which have been created by the state and for the sake of the state. These codes act against minority rights. They are made by men and work against the rights of women. Of course, the state and men do not want to give power away easily. They force minorities and women into slave conditions. That is why I went to the mountains to fight against the state. So when I say I went to the mountains, that's a kind of code for joining uh, the militant group. At the same time as I'm fighting for Kurdish rights, our fight is against the patriarchal structure of the state. Today, we're working for peace, and peace should include the rights of different ethnic groups like Kurds and also the rights of women. Until both of these are achieved, it is not possible to claim that we have peace. And without these, I will continue to fight, whether the state is Turkish or Kurdish. And I have to say, one of the things that really moved me was that several Kurdish activists told me nationalism is the problem, whether it is Turkish nationalism or Kurdish nationalism. Um, 
and I found that quite, um, yeah, I found that surprising because, you know, for people who don't have a state to say that, that that's quite something. Um, okay, now let me move to um, the other element of my research, which is sort of, you know, to, to find out, well, what, what is it about this specific political movement um, in terms of the claim that they are the ones who are really going to tackle gender-based inequalities? And are they different in the sense that what is happening now in Rojava or when, you know, PKK is fighting or the youth is fighting the state, are they actually able to translate on the one hand their rhetoric but also this sort of more egalitarian uh, utopian society under an armed conflict, are they able to translate that in terms of wider society? And um, as I said that uh, I was quite skeptical, uh, even sort of the idea of co-chairing. Um, and um, people had told me that I should go to Mardin, which is at the border of Syria, it's 25 kilometers um, north of the border of Syria. I should go to Mardin because it's an amazing town and it's very, there are people speaking Turkish, Arabic, Kurdish, Assyrian, it's a very multi-ethnic, uh, multi-religious town. Uh, but also they said you have to meet the co-mayor of Mardin. So um, I, I managed to get an appointment with her and uh, I ended up in her office and as you probably are aware of, you know, efficient people in the Middle East can have big desks, very big desks. I wish I had a desk like that. Anyway, so uh, I was asked to go into the office and uh, there was no one sitting behind the desk. There was a young woman sitting in front drinking tea and I started to, you know, chat with her, how are you? And I thought, okay, this must be the secretary or the assistant. And yes, the 27-year-old, uh, uh, sorry, 27-year-old uh, Fabrunie Acure was the co-mayor of this 800,000 uh, big uh, municipality. And not only did she become co-mayor of this town when she was 25 years old, uh, she is actually a Syrian, so there's a kind of a combination of uh, being a woman, being of ethnic minority in the Kurdish, what Kurdish community, um, and being young. I mean, because the other issue, of course, in terms of power and the leadership in the region is that it's, it's not mainly men, but it's mainly older people and youth are, you know, sidelined. So that, that was really... Uh, very uh, interesting. I just wanted to share with you just a few images. Uh, actually, you were able to, on a good clear day, one could see the border of Syria and actually at some point I could also hear some fighting going on, which was very pleasant. But it's a beautiful city, Mardin. Um, so, Febrini Akior told me we believe that our first problem in society is the gender problem. It's been a long and difficult process to get where we are now. But we are still only at the beginning and have not achieved what we want. Yes, of course, there was resistance when I was first elected to be co-mayor. I should say that her counterpart is one of the oldest. He's a veteran politician, uh, Ahmed Turk, who is uh, 71 years old. So it was you know, very challenging for her. But after one and a half years, people start to recognize me more as an equal and, uh, no, sorry. But after one and a half years, people start to recognize me more as an equal to my co-chair. Uh, and, you know, she, uh, you know, she spoke what I really liked about her was that she was also critical. I mean, she wasn't just telling me how wonderful everything was, but she's saying that it's, it's a struggle. You know, it's a struggle and that she has to, um, she spoke very uh, positively about her culture, but in terms of people's perception, uh, and that, of course, uh, you know, having co-chairs doesn't mean that, you know, people change their minds about women, and that there was still a sort of big gap between what's happening in terms of the political movement and what's happening in society. But I found her not only, you know, impressive in terms of, you know, all the, that she was a young woman 
ethnic religious minority, but you know, she was so so wise and sounded like someone with lots of political experience. The other person I uh, I was uh, very happy to speak to this is Gurta Kishanak, and she is the co mayor of Diyarbakir. And because Diyarbakir, as I told you, is the largest Kurdish town in southeastern Turkey, it's a bit like being the president of Kurdistan, or, you know, something like she's seen as one of the big political leaders given that Bachelan is in prison. And uh, she also blew my mind. I mean, she was amazing. Uh, so she told me, uh, we started code sharing in 2004, although at the time it was not legal. But women were all pressured by their male code chairs who perceived them as assistants. After 2007, women became more visible. The 2007 elections were revolutionary for both Kurdish and Turkish women. Eight out of 25 Kurdish MPs were women. Women became more confident co-chairs and men had to accept them as equals. And I should say, I, um, if you're interested, I published a longer interview. And she told me, I was imprisoned in the Avaka. I was tortured in prison. I was put in a dog's kennel because I wouldn't say I'm Turkish, I'm Kurdish. But all these experiences were not as difficult as fighting against my Kurdish male counterparts to achieve this co-chairing. Although they had agreed in theory, but to actually implement that in practice, she said that was a much harder and more painful struggle and experience. And she continued, she says, um, still there are many barriers. Sometimes there is a risk of ignoring your identity as a woman. So for instance, if you go to a mosque, they say, oh, you're welcome because you are the mayor. But I do not want to forget my identity as a woman. I don't want to be welcome as the mayor. This is a crucial point in our struggle. And if individuals give in to the temptation of privilege linked to status, we will lose our struggle. Individual women will succeed, but not women collectively. Women have to resist to fall into the trap of acting like men. I mean, that's amazing, OK? I mean, this is anywhere in the world, you know, in the UK, in Germany, in Egypt and the US, I think women do fall into the trap in positions of power and you know acting then acting out their power and sort of losing sight of the collective struggle which explains the Margaret Thatchers of the world. And there are many of them. And you know for her to, to say that and I felt and also what people told me about her, she doesn't just say that. She's really trying to live it. Let me try to come up with some reflections. And you know, one reason I was I wanted to speak with you about um, this research is because I'm interested in your views. So, I mean, I think that you know what so far for me emerged out of all this is that yeah, I and mean, I kind of knew this before, but it's it's very clear that we certainly have to to expand our conceptualization of conflict. You know, when the Turkish and Kurdish uh, human rights activists speak about conflict, they do not just speak about the state. They speak about you know, conflict also in terms of patriarchy and uh, conflict with them. Um, and uh, the other thing, as I said, you know, I, I think I started out being very skeptical about co-chairing, but I felt more positive after. And also because they really taken what I would say in gender theory, if you speak about intersectionality. It's not only about gender, but it's about the way that gender intersects with other forms of inequality, whether it's ethnicity, religion, sexuality, class, age. I don't, didn't feel it was a, you know, add women and stir approach. It was more transformative and, and more radical. Um, now, in terms of this, this shift away from nationalist discourse, um, you know, to this idea of radical democracy, I think I am skeptical. You know, I think that uh, many people might say it, but there are also lots of people who, you know, who still feel, especially now, that there's no way that, that you can achieve any kind of egalitarian democratic society under the current Turkish state. Um, but I think what it also shows me is that the Kurdish political movement is not homogeneous. Certainly the Kurdish political movement is not the PKK anymore, 
even the PKK, there are lots of different positions. Uh, there is the PKK, that's a youth movement, but there is also now a, a political movement outside of the PKK, and there are some tensions. And there are people, there are many Kurds who are actually invested in the political process, and they don't want to fight again. You know? There is also, I think, a class issue that, you know, since the 90s, you have seen the emergence of an urban middle class, an educated urban middle class, who actually have quite a bit to lose, and they don't want to go back to, to the 90s. Um, I think there's a tension in terms of, uh, you know, this whole idea of uh, the nation state is a problem, and we have to address issues transnationally, and that the vision for, you know, the, the better future is a kind of transnational but that in terms of political practice, everyday practice, it is really the state still uh, that the, the Kurdish activists were struggling against. Uh, now, in terms of my, my concerns and questions, um, well, I think the obvious one is, and I'm sure you ask yourself, you know, so how, how do these commitments to gender-based equality play out in practice? And, you know, okay, that's a practice in terms of political practice and the political movement, and then there is society more generally. And clearly, that would require, you know, some in-depth research. And there are some people who are doing that. Um, are we, I mean, one question I have is, are we witnessing the emergence of a new political elite that is out of touch with wider society? Right? You know, what, what are the links? And here, I think, again, it's complex. So my uh, PhD student, Isabel Keza, who spent longer time in Yabaka and also spent time in Rojava and Iraq and Kurdistan, tells me that you know, she spent time actually in villages and people would often say all the right things for three weeks and then one day while drinking tea would say, you know, this thing about gender based equality, you know, what it actually leads to is the woman divorcing the man and we don't really like it. So, you know, there's also, uh, I think especially, man sort of saying the right thing, but maybe not really thinking that it's really the right thing. Uh, so how deep-rooted is this, or is it rooted at all? Um, I think another question is whether the current, the, the current political movement is able to uphold the centrality of gender-based equality and justice in the current context of rising authoritarianism and violence. You know, how long will they be able to do that? And then, you know, the, the question, what is the impact of militarization? Because we know that, I mean, again, historically and cross-culturally, we know that the more militarized the society is, the greater instances of gender-based violence. So how is that going to play out? Okay, and now I'm coming to the most controversial bit, uh, I think, well, if I would say this uh, too, I haven't yet, no, it's not true, I've said it once to Kurdish political activists and they didn't very much like it, but actually I was, after I went, sort of a year ago, after I've done the research, I was totally, you know, impressed and I was very hopeful and inspired, and I, I still am. I think that given everything, I think it's one of the still inspiring political movements specifically in terms of you know, gender-based equality. But I am not convinced that they're going to succeed. And the main reason I'm not convinced that they're going to succeed is because they totally, totally dismiss sexuality. Okay? So in order to acquire gender-based um, equality, you have to be sexless, you have to be genderless. But not in a kind of progressive genderless way, but you have to deny your sexuality, you have to deny your desire, you have to de deny you know, any kind of relationship, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual relationship. And I just don't think it works, because what this creates is then this kind of utopian society where you're not supposed to, I mean, you're actually being told that, okay, if you have desire, you just have to read some more Echelan and it will go away. And, uh, you, you need more education, and education means reading Achelan, so it's, you know, it's indoctrination. Even if, you know, everything that's written in the books is great, but if you just read one also, then I think we have a problem. Um, 
but it also means that there will always be this gap between this very utopian, repressed society, and even you know, if the fighters manage to do that. But then there's this other world out there where reproduction is taking place, where you know, people have desires, and if there will be this big gap. Um, and I think that as long as the Kurdish political movement doesn't address that, I don't see the long-term uh, really uh, possibility to really translate that beyond the context of a military struggle. And on that note, I'm going to start.